Good morning and a hearty welcome to everyone. And thank you for participating this morning in this summit on public safety broadband. We are here this morning because we all recognize that it is imperative that we take advantage of emerging technology in the interest of the safety and security of the American people. This is not a matter of simply modernizing public safety communications equipment. We are aiming to build an interoperable national public safety broadband network that will make our nation safer and more resilient. As a nation, we are able to deal more effectively with unforeseen disasters and emergencies when first responders have interoperable communications and advanced data applications at their fingertips. As a nation, we are more capable of stopping the next terrorist attack when federal and law enforcement agencies can share information seamlessly and quickly on a secure platform. Wireless broadband can revolutionize how we respond to events, emergencies, and disasters, and how we conduct our law enforcement missions. The administration is firmly committing, committed to equipping first responders and law enforcement with next generation communications technologies that are secure, assured, and interoperable. The President's Wireless Innovation and Infrastructure Initiative outlines our vision for how we can deliver these capabilities, and we look forward to sharing more of that vision with you today. And as with any homeland endeavor, the federal government cannot do this alone, which is why we are so pleased to have our partners from throughout the country here with us today. Doing something this ambitious takes an all-of-nation approach, and we greatly appreciate your dedication, support, and contributions that are vital to achieving the vision of a national broadband network for public safety. And it's now my pleasure to introduce one of the most steadfast and ardent supporters of the public safety community. From his days as a senator to the time here at the White House, he has been a champion for first responders and law enforcement. His leadership on public safety broadband is a major reason why we are here today. And ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to introduce the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden. Thanks. Thank you all very, very much. You know, uh, I look out there and see an awful lot of familiar faces. This has been a long time in coming. There have been a lot of you who have been breaking your neck to get us uh, to this place, and uh, I want to say thank you. But I also want to uh, tell you uh, one of the reasons why I'm confident we're going to get there is because of Senator Rockefeller. Senator Rockefeller, in his committee, uh, did what most people out there other than this room do not understand. We've been trying to get here for 10 years. We've been trying to get here for 10 years. Old Kelly knows what we're trying to get, how long we've been trying to get here. And Rockefeller went out there and got Kay Bailey Hutchinson, who was another champion, and combined in what used to be sort of standard procedure in the bad old days when I was a senator, there was actually bipartisan consensus, and they worked out something really important. You know, my dad used to have an expression. He'd say, I'd come back and I'd say, but dad, I thought, he said, whoa, hey, Jim, if everything is equally important to you, nothing is important to you. What we're talking about here is not whether or not you need what is going to be discussed today. You know how badly you need it. It's about who gets it. It's about who gets it. There's only most so much space on the highway here, man. And so the question is, how does it get allocated? And a lot of very serious interest have concluded that the priorities were you were not the top priority. I mean, that's as simple as when you, when you cut through everything here. And in the budget negotiations, which I have the dubious distinction of um, running these days, this is an issue. This is a revenue issue. We're going to sell some of the spectrum. There's a lot of pull and tug in terms of priorities. All of it goes to deficit reduction. It's a lot of money. All of it goes to compensate for loss of a program and boom. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, the money is going to be there in terms of the overall long-term budget deal we're working on. But I want to
And having an Attorney General and a Secretary of Homeland Security who feel as strongly about it as, as Senator Rockefeller does, and that I do, and John Brennan, and Governor O'Malley, and I could list, the list goes on, uh, is, is very consequential. Again, it's about priorities. It's about priorities. So I want to welcome everyone here. This room is full of the best collection of the, some of the literally bravest Americans we have here in this country. I mean, every day, a lot of you folks out there, you're sitting there now with bars and stripes on your shoulders, or you're sitting in suits you can now afford. But for a long, long time, you went out and strapped on a sidearm and a badge every single day, and you walked out in the street not knowing what in God's name you were going to be met with. And uh, uh, it, is, uh, it is a tribute to uh, your steadfastness on this issue that it doesn't surprise me, though. I think you're all crazy. Um, I think you're all crazy for doing what you've done. I wouldn't have taken your jobs for all the rice in China, as my mother used to say, um, because the truth of the matter is it takes real courage to do what you've been doing. And we understand what you go through, that we recognize, and I don't, it's not hyperbole, the bravery you display simply putting on that shield and the, your troops going out there every single day, putting your lives on the line, and your families who know every single day you walk out, there's a little nagging piece in the back of their head of what's going to happen today. So for a whole lot of reasons, for a whole lot of reasons, beyond the substance of reasons you're going to talk about here today, we owe it to, we owe it to you, no differently than we owe it to the men and women we send to Afghanistan and Iraq into harm's way to make them the best equipped of any Army, any Marine Corps, any in the world. We owe the same obligation to you. So those of you who worked me a long time know my view on this starts in my gut, works through my heart, and gets to my head, because you deserve it. And we need to equip you in the way you're going to talk about it today in order to protect us. It also has the great advantage of being in the overwhelming self-interest of the American people. And because of your service to us, the President and I have committed to making sure, with John's leadership, we push this through. What we're doing uh, is that uh, through uh, dramatically improving technology available to you, we're going to change the circumstance for the American people. Like so many of you, I've, I've been working on this issue for a long time, and I'm happy about the progress we've made so far earlier this year. I was pleased the President made the first significant step announcing the administration's wireless broadband plan, which had two important parts. One, the allocation of Spectrum D block, uh, which is a fancy way of saying we're giving you bandwidth that other people have been occupying that you need more than they need. I know that's not fancy, guys, to the press. I'm going to get wise Biden talk, but it's that simple. Not because they didn't use the bandwidth well. You need it more. You need it more. We're also giving the resources to finally deploy a wireless nationwide public safety network. Building this network was going to prevent the kind of communications failures that happened on 9-11 when firefighters and police couldn't talk to each other. And five years later in Katrina, when the same lesson was pounded home again in a literal and a figurative sense. So now, instead of operating outdated radios on different bandwidths uh, and frequencies, you're going to have the option of using a fully interoperable nationwide network that's going to allow you the latest technology and the best and best possibility of coordinating your capabilities. You're going to be able to do things you should have been able to do a decade ago. Scanning fingerprints, checking them against databases with handheld devices, downloading floor plans of burning buildings, sending photos and videos from an accident scene ahead to the ER room so instantly they're ready and prepared to know what they're coming. You know, my grandkids have been able to do this with their iPhones for a while. Literally. Heck, I, I, even I have learned how to do a lot of this with my iPhone and my iPad. But it's technologically, the, its technological capability is inexplicable that we haven't made it available to the place it is most needed. And this is going to literally transform, I believe, the way you guys and women have been doing your jobs. Look, uh, there's a bit of gridlock here in Washington right now, but I don't believe this place doesn't function. I believe it will function. I believe we'll get to the right place. I believe we will be able to do the things that the country knows we have to do. 
And some would say, well, you know, I, in the White House, as Eric can tell you, occasionally I'm referred to as the White House optimist, as if my grandfather would say, as if I just fell off the turnip truck yesterday. Hell, I've been around for eight presidents. I promise you, we're going to be able to get this stuff done. Because it has to be done. It has to be done. This isn't a Republican issue. This isn't a Democratic issue. This is a truly bipartisan interest, interest with a lot of interest groups out there. We have to say, you ain't bad guys, but you're not first in line. You know, it's simply too important, not only for your safety, but for our safety. And our safety increases in direct proportion that you're safer. It's a simple proposition. I learned from firefighters. The degree to which you have more firefighters in a job, you have fewer deaths. You have fewer injuries of firefighters. It's the same way with you guys who are out there as police officers. So look, we're another step closer, closer to making this a reality. It's not there yet. As I said last week, Senator uh, Rockefeller and Hutchinson, uh, they moved uh, S-911 forward, passing out of the committee, which you would have thought would have been a no-brainer we were able to do even when I was there. The 10th anniversary of 9-11 approaches, we urge the Congress to continue moving toward this legislation. I think it's imperative, and I think we've got to keep the, the drums beating. The only way this will not come to fruition is if we take our foot off the pedal, if we let up, if we think that this is now inevitable, this is going to happen. There is inertia that always works in this town, no matter who's president, no matter what the circumstances are. You got to keep pushing. So we're going to be a pain in the neck to you, as we always are. How many times have I called some of you guys say, I need you on the hill? I need you to stand there. I need you to physically be there. I need you to pick up the phone and call so-and-so. Well, I'm not going to be quarterback in that effort like uh, Senator Rockefeller and others are doing up on the hill. But with I'm going to be following the lead of these two people on my left here, three people on my left, to make sure that we just keep this front and center. This is our shot to significantly increase the safety and security of the American people. It is as important as any other thing we could do by a piece of legislation. And so, folks, um, it's about more than the bandwidth and the spectrum. It's about you. It's about all you do. It's about what this administration values, the importance of your work, the value and courage you display. And it's about an administration that will fight like crazy uh, for what is best for you to be able to protect us. Um, and there's no one, uh, no one who fights harder for you all, and it's not hyperbole. There's no one fights harder for you all. You've never had a better friend in, as the Attorney General of the United States and Eric Holder. So, folks, I wish I could stay for more reasons than you know. I'm a, <laughs> more reasons than you know. I know what I'm talking about here. I'm about to go. I'm not so sure. So I want to thank you all so much. Thanks for staying in the fight. And, uh, and we're going to get this done. Eric, it's all yours, buddy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all. Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. There you go. Uh, I want to thank the Vice President and uh, say hello to Senator Rockefeller for joining us today. Uh, the Vice President's leadership and his commitment to ensuring that our nation's first responders have the tools and the capabilities that they need have, I think, been essential in bringing us to uh, this moment today. Uh, because of his work and the many partners that we have gathered here, we've never been closer to uh, realizing our goal of enabling public safety officers to take full advantage of the benefits of broadband technology. Now, as we have seen repeatedly, and most clearly as the Vice President indicated on September the 11th and in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, in times of crisis and emergency, law enforcement officers and first responders must be able to communicate quickly across all jurisdictions. <clears throat> and as national security and public safety threats have continued to grow and to evolve, the need to bring public safety communications into the 21st century really has never been greater. That's why over the last two years, the Department of Justice has taken an active role in helping to ensure that the communication needs of federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement agencies are met. 
Now, with outstanding leadership from Associate Attorney General Tom Pirelli, from Assistant Attorney General Lori Robinson and her colleagues in the Office of Justice Programs and the National Institute of Justice, and from Director uh, Bernie Malikian uh, and his team in the Office of Community Oriented Policing Services, COPS, we have worked in partnership with the White House and the Departments of Homeland Security and Commerce to facilitate a series of discussions concerning the public safety, broadband network, and the future of the D-Block. And for as long as it takes, we will continue bringing together policymakers and leaders from law enforcement, the broader public safety community, and the telecommunications industry to determine a path forward. Today, although obstacles to instant communication between first responders remain, the good news is that a solution is within view. Thanks to extraordinary bipartisan leadership, a legal framework which invests in public safety broadband communications is moving forward in Congress. And the Department of Justice and our fellow federal agency partners are now developing the tools, the technologies, and the governance strategies necessary to bring today's public safety operations to the next level. For example, the FBI is currently working on the first cut of some exciting public safety applications, which you're going to hear about uh, more later on. The COPS office is collaborating with police departments around the country to help them prepare to utilize broadband communications capabilities. And the National Institute of Justice is investing in research and development initiatives aimed at allowing our law enforcement and public safety partners to be even more effective in the field. Now, this approach is showing signs of promise, but we are not there yet. We must continue to cooperate, to advocate, and to raise awareness about the fact that we can fight crime more successfully. We can ensure the security of our homeland more reliably, and we can protect our fellow citizens and our first responders more effectively by equipping public safety officers with cutting edge communications technology. This is what they deserve. This is what you deserve. And with your continued support, it is what you all can expect. Now, I want to thank each and every one of you for your ongoing commitment to this work. And I'm pleased now to turn things over to a key leader and a key partner in meeting the public safety and national security goals uh, that we all share my good friend, Secretary Janet Napolitano. Well, thank you and, and good morning. It's a pleasure uh, to be here with so many of the key stakeholders and partners uh, in this process. Uh, as has been said, and we will say it again, the ability of our nation's emergency responders to effectively communicate is it paramount to the safety and security of our country. During emergency situations, it is critical that you can share information across multiple jurisdictions and disciplines in order to protect lives and to protect property. Uh, that's one of the major lessons learned from the communications challenges faced by emergency responders on 9-11. And that's why one of the 9-11 Commission's key recommendations was the establishment of a nationwide interoperability public safety communications network. So over the past 10 years, our country hasn't stood still. We have indeed made critical strides in strengthening overall security and national preparedness. The public safety community has made significant progress improving emergency communication capabilities through enhanced coordination, planning, training, and equipment. However, we have been limited by wireless technologies that were introduced decades ago. We cannot fully achieve the vision set forth by the 9-11 Commission until emergency responders have an advanced, nationwide, inherently interoperable public safety communications network. Recent developments in high-speed wireless communications technology represent a new opportunity for responders to have significantly greater interoperability, operability, and capability. These broadband advancements can provide responders with access to information that will improve their ability to safely and efficiently manage their daily activities and respond at all levels of emergency situations. 
For example, as President Obama said in the State of the Union address, these advancements can now enable a firefighter to use a handheld device to download the design of a building before arriving at the scene of a fire. These types of capabilities have the potential to save countless lives. So that's why it's so important that the administration across multiple agencies and departments and commissions has been coordinating with the public safety community, the private sector, and Congress, thank you, Senator Rockefeller, on initiatives to, for the deployment and development of a nationwide public safety broadband network. Now, uh, the Department of Homeland Security will continue to collaborate with all of you, our partners in the public and private sectors, in building and implementing a policy framework for emergency communications that meets the needs of public safety users and aligns with existing emergency communication policies. This includes implementing the right governance structure to manage the network and addressing requirements that meet the needs of all users. We have to ensure we build this network with all of our stakeholders at the table and with a clear plan in mind that supports today's mission critical communications capabilities while building for the future. The Department of Homeland Security through our Office of Emergency Communications is updating the National Emergency Communications Plan to support the operational and technological integration and transition needed to enable the use of broadband technology for voice and data communications. We will continue to support states in preparing for broadband deployment by encouraging the inclusion of broadband planning into statewide communication interoperability plans and we are providing technical assistance to assist state, local, territorial, and tribal users to understand and implement options for the use of broadband technology in public safety. Our emergency responders perform their missions every day, sometimes under extraordinarily challenging conditions. We need to make sure that they, and that many of you, have access to the most advanced tools and technology to carry out your missions. We've made progress. If we continue to work together, and we will, we can build a nationwide public safety broadband network to achieve our shared vision for the future. And to help us do that, I'd like to turn uh, the podium now over to a true leader in this area, the chair of the FCC, Julius Denichkowski. Well, thank you, Secretary Napolitano. I'm uh, honored to be here with uh, such a distinguished group, uh, both uh, on the dais and here in this room. Uh, thanks to the work of so many people in this room and congressional leaders like Senator Rockefeller, who is here, and Senator Hutchinson, we are closer than ever to achieving the vital goal of funding and building a nationwide interoperable communications network for our first responders. It's been almost 10 years since 9-11, seven years since the 9-11 Commission urged action to ensure that police, firefighters, and other first responders can communicate over an interoperable network. The communications world has changed dramatically since 9-11. People then barely used text messaging, only a tiny percentage of cell phones had cameras, few mobile phones had broadband internet access, and today's vibrant apps landscape was years from being born. The unfortunate truth is that the capability of our emergency response communications hasn't kept pace with commercial innovation, hasn't kept pace with what ordinary people and businesses now do every day with communications devices. Our first responders don't have an interoperable mobile broadband network. Our 911 systems generally can't handle text messages or pictures or videos from mobile phones. The communications technology needs of our public safety community must be met. That's why in the FCC's National Broadband Plan, a primary recommendation was that a public safety mobile broadband network finally be funded and built. Everyone here has made this a vital priority. The challenges to progress have been real, but enough is enough. The FCC stands ready to serve as a resource to our colleagues across government and in the public safety community. 
We've already taken actions within our power to advance public safety communications. With input from the public safety community, and I see many of you here, we've helped establish a framework for an interoperable network, including adopting a common air interface for such a network. We've authorized over 20 jurisdictions for early deployment of the public safety broadband network, and we've worked with NTIA to assure funding to many of those networks. We recently announced the accelerated deployment of a new national emergency alert system plan, with the help of Commissioner Kelly in New York, which will enable consumers to have emergency alerts sent directly to their mobile phones. And we're ramping up our work on next generation 911. I applaud Chairman Rockefeller, Senator Hutchinson, and the Senate Commerce Committee for their strong bipartisan action two weeks ago to move forward with a public safety mobile broadband network and with the incentive auctions to free up new spectrum for commercial use and raise significant amounts of money to fund this network. The timing is right. With the rollout of commercial 4G wireless, we have an opportunity now to build a resilient and hardened mobile broadband network for first responders at significantly lower cost than if we wait. But we need to act not just because we'll save money, we need to act because it'll save lives. Imagine major hurricanes or wildfires like the one currently devastating eastern Arizona that require backup assistance from emergency personnel in neighboring states. If we act, first responders from different jurisdictions will be able to better coordinate their response, improving results on the ground, and saving lives. Imagine your 19-year-old son gets in a car accident. If we act, he or someone else in the car would be able to send pictures of his injuries in the scene to 911, which EMTs could review in advance. And once on the scene, the EMTs could send critical information back to hospitals, including on-site scans and diagnostic information, increasing his odds of recovery. The Vice President gave examples. Uh, my prior speakers gave examples. There are so many ways that moving forward quickly with this broadband network for public safety will enhance security and save lives. Now, to get this network built, there are still tough issues to work through, and we may not agree on every detail, but we all agree on the need for action. We agree on the need to resolve open issues collaboratively and quickly. We agree on the vital importance of finally funding and building a mobile broadband public safety network for our first responders. Working together with focus and energy, we can deliver for the public that they have every right to expect, a public safety communications network that harnesses modern technology to protect safety and save lives. I look forward to working with all stakeholders, the public safety community, our federal partners, and members of Congress to get this done. With that, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Governor O'Malley, who's been a strong leader and advocate for a nationwide public safety network, both as governor of Maryland and as chair of the National Governors Association Public Safety Committee. Governor O'Malley. Thanks, Thank Thanks very much. Thanks. Chairman Janikowski, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Attorney General Holder, Secretary Napolitano, Assistant to the President John Brennan, it's an honor to be here on this very distinguished uh, panel. And I'm honored to join you today and provide uh, a state perspective, a local perspective, uh, dare I presume to say a municipal perspective, having once been mayor of Baltimore for a couple of terms and once a mayor, always a mayor. But in a background where we see uh, some really uh, uh, damaging cuts to Homeland Security grants. This day is a bright contrast, a real solid movement forward for first responders at the municipal, at the local, and at the statewide level. Why do we say that? You know, in Maryland, uh, we, uh, and particularly in Baltimore, uh, we pride ourselves on being the place that without a federal government to back us up, with our nation's capital burned to the ground, we hung uh, strong and, and defended the Star-Spangled Banner and America's Liberty. So in Maryland, we've been doing Homeland Security since 1814. <laughs> and, and given our proximity to the nation's capital, we've always felt a, a very personal responsibility and imperative to be leaders in Homeland Security. And that's why for the last 10 years since those um, uh, tragic attacks, uh, we have been driving to achieve 12 goals in our state. Number one 10 years ago, number one today is interoperable communications, both in terms of radio communications as well as our ability to communicate information over broadband to the field. Uh, 
None of us has forgotten the, uh, that day, uh, September 11th. And uh, we know that during an emergency, when first responders are coming in from other jurisdictions to big events, whether man-made, whether natural, interoperability is not only critical for the coordination, communication, cooperation necessary to attack the public safety threat, it's essential to protect the public safety force. So we have not only set the goal of interoperability, we've been driving forward uh, towards that goal. Uh, we, we have, uh, in an era when we've um, made tremendous cuts to our operating budget, we have nonetheless increased and improved upon the big investments that we've been able to make with our federal government to achieve interoperability. We're making real progress, building a state-of-the-art 700 megahertz interoperable radio system that's accessible to every public safety officer across our state. Already to date, we have regional interoperability uh, solutions on an interim basis for 23 of our 26 jurisdictions, regionally across four of our five regions, with our final region and last counties coming online by the end of the year. But there is so much more to do, and that is why I am so excited uh, by President Obama's, uh, not only by his vision, but by his action plan by the commitment that he's made to actually deliver this result 10 years after the attacks of September 11th of having interoperable communications and broadband for all our first responders. And I really want to applaud and uh, uh, the leadership of Senator Rockefeller. Sir, as chair of the committee and moving forward on uh, Senate Bill 911, uh, this would not be happening without your leadership and then your ability to forge that bipartisan consensus that we should always have to protect the public safety. Over the past decade, many of us have worked to secure our states and cities, sometimes feeling like uh, maybe the federal government did not care. That's not true in this administration. Uh, this new network will help us make sure that the sort of failures that happen in communications on 9-11, technical failures, uh, do not happen now. There's absolutely no reason why teenagers should be more advanced in their technology and doing video games than our first responders are in protecting lives. This new capability will enhance what we're already doing in our state to secure our port and transit systems. This new network will give us the, the capability to uh, uh, sh streamline uh, video, images, information, uh, 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 all sorts of critical public safety information. When a big emergency happens, when lives are at stake and citizens call 911, the phone doesn't ring at the White House, doesn't ring at the State House. It rings at the police departments, at the local emergency responders, and that's why this capacity is so critically important. Uh, it, this capacity will be resilient. It will allow the network to be used at times when private networks and other band might be overwhelmed. Uh, the innovative way that revenues are, are being uh, uh, captured to make sure that not only we have the lane on the highway for public safety, but that we have the vehicle so our first responders can act effectively on that highway is critically important. And for states the advan and cities and counties, the advantages of this network will be, will be capabilities that will be used not only in big emergencies, but every single day. That critical dual purpose necessary to protect lives in, in the fires that happened uh, every single day, to protect lives uh, against those that would harm and, uh, and shoot other Americans. So I thank you and I th applaud the President and his administration for this solid step forward. This is one of the best things that has happened from a local, state, and municipal perspective on interoperability in a long, long time. So now it's my... Um, a duty to bring forward the first panel, and I'd like to introduce the moderators. They are Acting Deputy Undersecretary Greg Schaefer and Deputy Associate Attorney General A. Marissa Chun. Thank you.